I have a question in context, and I'll give you the context. But what had been happening in the book of Job was Job had experienced all this loss that God had given him into the hand of Satan, saying to him, well, have you considered my servant Job? Like, have you considered, like, messing with him a little bit? And um, Satan takes up, takes away everything, takes his, like, all the money, everything he owns, and, and then he ends up actually inflicting pain upon his body because Satan says there's, no, there's nothing that a man wouldn't give for his, his life. And God says, okay, take his body, but don't, just, just don't kill him. So in that context, he has that. And then he has three friends that come along, and I think it's three or four, that come along and speak to him and like mourn with him. But then there's this younger guy named Elihu, and he listens to all these 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 men talk about the things that they do and like kind of bicker back and forth to each other, talking about how um, the righteousness of God and their standpoint and stuff. And then Elihu comes in and he's like, um, he starts talking about how he listens to their wisdom, but then he also is wanting them to listen to him because he's allowed them to speak out of their age and thought that they would be wise in that. But then also, um, my main question is, is, so from that context, he goes on and he says this to them. In chapter 33, um, he, this is after chapter 32, which it says in there that the words of Job are ended. And then Elihu starts to speak. In chapter 33, verse 14 says, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. And my question from that is, do you think God changes his mind based on the free will of human nature or the human mind? Like, do you think that God's all-sufficient knowledge and knowing what's going to happen, do you think sometimes he changes how he's going to play something out in his children's lives, the way that they react to a situation like Job experiencing what he did. Boy, I'm glad we got to the main question. We were going, all, uh, we're going to do the whole book of Job. That is a good question. So I, I Thank had to give you. you context in order to actually ask No, the no, that is that good. Was, does that God is good. change his mind, and does he do so in Job 33? So let's look at Job 33, and... Uh, in your Bibles, and what we're doing tonight is just kind of a, well, for us, it's just a, like a little trip back in time because uh, actually uh, the way that the Apostle Paul taught uh, in, as he did his missionary journeys and planted churches, because there were a mix of people in the congregation, often from the synagogue, the Jewish people that were steeped in the scriptures, and many of them unsaved and came to Christ, and then the pagans who had no biblical knowledge, both groups need to understand how to connect what they were hearing with the rest of the Bible plus everything else they were trying to figure out in life. And so Paul dialogued, and the word dialogue, dia logizomai, he, logizomai means to, to kind of process through, talk through, even kind of orderly go through, and dia uh, means uh, through, so through to talk uh, is explaining things. And so Job 33, 14, let's talk through that. For God may speak in one way or another, yet man does not perceive it. And this is, you know, it, it is kind of touching on the doctrines we're going to look at tonight, that God in various situations relates himself to humanity in ways that we can understand. And, and we're going to talk about that. But the bigger question, I really think what the, the question was that night is, does God change his mind? And, and that's, that's a good one. So uh, uh, the quick answer is yes and no. I should have told him that. You know, that would have uh, saved a lot of time. But uh, what I want you to see, and I want you to look with me, is uh, Job 33, 14 has a lot in common with what God says in Genesis 6, 6, where it says that, that God regretted that he created humanity. Sounds like, whoa, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. Moses and the golden calf. God says, I'm going to kill them all. Moses says, don't. And it's, the Lord said, okay, I won't. How did he go from kill them all to no? I mean, he changed his mind on us. Uh, how about God and King Saul? It, it grieved the Lord, and he regretted that he made Saul king. Sounds like changed his mind again. 
How about Ahab? Ahab was the worst king of all. In fact, we should look at some of these. Let's look at 1 Kings 21. And, and I just want you to see what, what those who are reading through, they're going in their read through the Bible uh, time, and they get to 1 Kings 21, and they get to verse 19, and it says, uh, uh, the Lord actually came to Elijah in verse 17 and told him, arise and go. And in verse 19, so Elijah, remember we talked about this morning, sometimes God talks audibly in times past. Uh, God spoke in sundry manners, as Hebrews says, sometimes audibly. Sometimes he sends a messenger, the Old Testament prophets. That's what's happening. God's speaking directly to Ahab, verse 19. And he's telling Elijah to tell him this. You shall speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak in, to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood. And Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you've sold yourself to do evil. And I will bring calamity on you, and I will take away your posterity. I will cut off from Ahab every male of Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, and because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And then he continues. I mean, Elijah was not a, you know, a win friends and influence people person. He says, uh, and concerning Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dogs will eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And the dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab that dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. Now here's an editorial comment from the Lord. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel and his wife stirred him up. And he had be behaved very abominably in following idols according to all the Amorites had done, which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So you're expecting him to get whacked. And now look what happens. Verse 27. So it was when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, he put sackcloth on his body, he fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring calamity on his house. There he did it again. He changed his mind. How do you deal with... And, and we could go on through. Hezekiah. The Lord says, you're going to die. Get ready for death. And Hezekiah cried, turned his face to the wall, weeped and wept and wailed and cried out and begged the Lord, and the Lord gave him 15 more years. I mean, does that mean everybody that turns toward the wall and cries and cries out to the Lord gets 15 more years? See, when you read these things at face value, and then here's another one. Here's the classic one. Jonah. Uh, look at Jonah chapter 3. Uh, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So just turn about eight back from Matthew. Just eight clicks back from Matthew and uh, those little books. Jonah, and uh, look at chapter 3, verses 4 and 10. And he's, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, by the way, this is an eight-word sermon. Talk about a challenge. He preached a sermon eight words long and had probably the most spectacular revival that's ever recorded in the history of humanity. An entire city of probably several hundred thousand people was totally moved and transformed. So, eight word sermon, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now look at verse 10. And, and by the way, they really got moved. Uh, verse 7 says, Neither man nor beast nor herd nor uh, flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry to God. Everyone turn from his evil way. Verse 9, Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so we may not perish? So it was a citywide revival with an eight-word sermon um, that God energized with conviction. And look at verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster. Now, this is where people all the time say, oh, you know, there, there's, God is changing his mind. 
that he, would, that he had said he would bring upon them. So they accuse, and I'm not saying our friend that asked questions is accusing that, but, and I could just keep listening. So these are just the ones I just sat down this afternoon and whipped off uh, thinking just from reading the Bible. And you could, you could find many of these. But what do all of them have in common? They all have in common. It looks like God changes his mind. Now, um, I'm not sure what color my pens are tonight. Boy, that's not the right one. There we go. Um, this one involves prayer. Uh, this one involves prayer. And uh, this one and this one. This this one, there's no repentance. Uh, this one is re no repentance. Uh, this one is repentance. And this one is repentance. So there's, they kind of go, these two, he changed his mind because they repented for various amounts of time. These two, he changed his mind because they, uh, you know, were, were beseeching him and praying. And these two, God just says that, that uh, I'm just sad that I created those rebellious... You know what verse 5 says? The verse just before this verse says, and every imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of mankind was only evil continually. When, remember, God sees and hears and knows everything, and he said, all I'm getting on every channel from every human is bad. So the Lord grieved and... and uh, uh, it grieved his heart. And the same thing with making Saul king. So there's something in common with all of them, but there are some differences. Now, whenever you get hard things like this, it's, the first thing is God appears to change his mind. So what we do is we look at the actions of God, and then we interpret them by what we know already that's established about the character of God. Now, now here's the lesson. That's why I said yes and no, because you'll see two separate strains of how God is working here. The lesson is God always acts in accord with his character, that is, his attributes. God always, you can, you can predict God's reaction because it follows his character. Now, sometimes um, we don't fully understand his character. We only know the parts that have been revealed. So what we do uh, to, to answer these is what I call, this is a quick theology class. This is what I had to endure uh, for a long time. In fact, one of the hardest courses you'll ever take in seminary is systematic theology. Uh, because back then, they've changed things. A uh, generation ago, most of your theology book was written in Latin, German, Greek, and Hebrew. And it was like you skipped between the English words, and it was very hard. Uh, especially if you didn't know Latin and Greek and Hebrew and German. Um, but let me just give you five doctrines, four attributes, one doctrine. And then wh what you do is you take, you take the questionable act, what God does. So this is uh, God's actions. What, what were his actions? Uh, at the creation, of, or I mean, at the flood, at the golden calf, at Saul's, you know, rebellion, at Ahab's abomination, at Hezekiah's sickness, and at Nineveh's repentance. God, God has recorded actions in those. Now, I told you that, that two of these, at least, this one, the golden calf incident, and this one, uh, Hezekiah's 15 extra years, both were precipitated by prayer. So we have to look at the doctrine of prayer in the scripture, and it might surprise you uh, what, I mean, if you truly sum, in fact, I was having a big discussion this afternoon with someone, and said that, that <clears throat> one of the great ways to study biblical doctrines is there are two, two methods. There's systematic theology, ST, and then there's biblical theology, BT. Systematic theology kind of blends the whole Bible and then pours it out and lets it kind of settle into all different, you know, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, blending something and letting the layers come out. That's systematic theology. You just, 
You take the whole Bible, you dismember it, and just put it all together, and then settle it out into the 54 realms of doctrine. That's systematic theology. Biblical theology looks at theology as an unfolding, starting in Genesis, going like this, culminating in Revelation, and within that historic unveiling, Moses reveals a certain part, and the prophets reveal a certain part, and there's kind of like this building of theology, and they call it Petrine, Peter, Pauline, Paul, Johanna, and John, etc., etc. And so biblical theology starts with looking at the unfolding doctrine of all these, and, and if you look at prayer that way, what you see is prayer really grows the more we understand until the culmination is praying in Jesus' name. But we'll look at that in just a moment. And then these, immutability, which is the unchangeableness of God, the eternity of God, which, you know, most of us think of God as, you know, everlasting, but we haven't thought what that means. And uh, we'll look at some verses on that. This one might be the most comforting of all of them. That is that, that God always uses, has the best results in mind and uses the best means to get to those results. The, the doctrine of wisdom, now that's, that's not a theological one, that's just how I say it. But his wisdom, God's wisdom has all to do with how he has planned for things to happen. He always has the best plan uh, for getting the results and the method of getting those results. And so God always is all wise. And then omniscience. Um, which is a fascinating, we all know the omnis, you know, he knows everything and the ones that aren't on here, he's everywhere present, has all power. But specifically, these actions, God regretting he created humanity, God not burning up all the Israelites because Moses said, what would the Egyptians think if you haul them out of Egypt and then burn them up in the desert? You know, like you're a, you don't, you're not a good God. <laughs> And so it looks like the Lord says, oh, oh, that was a bad idea. Okay, I won't do it. So we're going to talk about that. And then regretting that he picked Saul. God knew before he created the world that Saul was a dud. You understand that? See, that's what this one means. And not burning up the Israelites, he burned them up anyway. He just burned them up over 40 years instead of one moment. You understand that? All of these, if you think about it, God still, every Ninevite died. They just didn't die right away. Hezekiah died. He didn't die right away. He lived 15 years. But what did he have the third year into his extra time? The worst king ever of Israel, Manasseh, who burned babies alive. So, okay, he extended his life and we had the worst king of all. Uh, you know, Ahab, Ahab didn't, uh, didn't die on the spot, but the dogs did, you know, drink his blood, and they also ate his wife. So, I mean, it all happened, but later. And Saul was kicked out as king, but he was killed by the, the people he spared. You know, he didn't kill the Amalekites, so an Amalekite killed him. God always, I mean, it's amazing. And <clears throat> I already talked about that one, and the Lord did regret that he created, so he started over again with, with Noah. But Let's talk about these attributes. So let's do a real quick, um, and this is fascinating to me. The four attributes. Now, see, look back at them. His eternity, immutability, wisdom, and omniscience. Number one, eternity. Now, this is, this is not the, the, in fact, I brought to you. I will read the, the big one. But, um, but this is my short version. The attribute of God called is eternity, and there are 25 attributes of God that are that are listed in systematic theology. Uh, not, not every systematic theology calls them the same thing. In fact, the 25th one is God's glory, and God's glory is not really an attribute. It is a glow. It is a, a bright, blinding, shining light that's around him, but it does typify something only God has. So don't worry about the number. But one of the attributes of God is his eternity. This is how I define it, that God is seeing everything at once viv vividly, past, present, and future. In fact, let, let me show you what I mean. Look at Isaiah 57. And these, I would encourage you, um, if you'd like, to just, I mark these. Uh, I'm on a slow attribute of God march through my Bible, that every time one of the key 
references that describes an attribute of God that I bump into, I write attribute, what it is, and I circle the verse so that whenever that I'm reading through the scriptures, in fact, that's one of the, the reasons, uh, you know, I have every possible electronic study tool there is. In fact, I've reproduced my entire 5,000 volume library. I'm on 4,500 of the 5,000s that I carry around in my little air. You know, I, I, I'm very electronic loving. But there is something about me looking at the pages of this Bible. Now, you can look at a cyber page, and there's nothing wrong with it, um, unless the power is off for, you know, a little too long, and then you lose it. But other than that, it's nothing wrong with it. But what you don't see on the cyber page is glancing across ages of your studies that have been marked in your Bible, that when you see them, you instant, now I know, I know you can make little notes and everything in your electronic stuff, but you have to go to them and move around. But just glancing, I can glance at this and I can see what I read two years ago and found, and I can see what I just wrote in there today, and all of them jog memory. So that's why I say write in your Bible, because when you look at a page, especially as you're flipping, this is what you can't do in electronic stuff, as you're flipping between, I am reviewing everything that I've ever studied on that topic as it goes by without fiddling and faddling. But <clears throat> never mind, that was my little advertisement for why uh, I have electronics and don't like to use them in personal Bible study. Isaiah 57, this middle verse right here, look what it says. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, so that's the eternity of God, but also the holiness of God. I dwell in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Now, you notice God says, I'm up here, but I dwell with him. So in other words, the idea is that, and you see it operative in old Ahab. Ahab, the worst abomination king, because he humbled himself, and, and the old King James says, walk softly in front of God. God says, whoa, wow. See, God responds to human actions. He responds with judgment to rebellion and sin, and he responds with mercy in repentance and humility. So you notice that in this, that, that he says, I dwell in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. That means he lifts us up to him to revive the heart of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite. Na, 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 na. What's the attribute there? Eternity. God inhabits eternity. You understand that time will cease to exist if God ever stopped perpetuating it. Because everything except God needs perpetuation. It needs empowerment. It needs to be allowed to continue because nothing can continue on its own except the one who is eternity. Only God is self-sufficient, self-existent, ever existing with all power needing not to be charged up and plugged in at night and sleep. God is eternally self-existent. Nothing else is. The angels aren't. They only exist because he, he allows them to continue. We certainly aren't. Do you know why sleep, do you know why humans have to sleep? To remind us we can't even keep ourselves awake. I mean, that poor layman Goldman Sachs trader last week, he was so busy making money and trading, uh, you know, how they have all those screens and he was doing, crossed all the time zones trading and he just forgot to stop trading and he died. They said he stayed awake too long and worked too much and his body just died. He just refused to sleep because he was making so much money for Goldman Sachs or whoever he was working for. God inhabits eternity and so time is one dimension that he created that he's it's allowing time to continue. And by the way, he's going to allow time to continue forever. Do you know how we know that? Because everlasting life, everlasting speaks of endless, constant, ongoing succession. See, in eternity, we will be singing songs. Do you know to sing a song, you have to do this word and then this word and then this word. It's a succession. 
and time is involved. And, and the fruits, and I mean, I, that's not our topic tonight, but what we're talking about is God sees everything at once, vividly, past, present, and future, because he is eternal. He alone is eternal. The devil can't see everything past, present, and future. The highest angels can't see everything because they are not eternity. Now, let me just read uh, the longer. Um, God's eternity may be defined as God has no beginning, end, or succession of moments in his own being. He sees all time equally vividly, yet God sees events in time and acts in time. And so that's the heavy-duty theological definition. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says, Before the heavens were brought forth, or ever thou hast created the earth, you are the same. And it says here that uh, he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And what it's saying is that God sees everything at once, vividly, past, present, and future. So that's the first thing to think about when you're wondering about whether he changed his mind. He sees everything at once. He saw before he created anything, and he sees after the whole rebellion's over and we're in eternity with him, and he sees a whole lot more. He sees it all at once, equally vividly, whether it's past, present, future, yet God acts and operates within time, but he's not there himself. He can operate in it, but he's not bound by it. Okay, here's another one before you drowned on that one. His unchangeableness. Now, we know this by that other word, immutability. But immutable is kind of not a common English word. So changeable, people understand. So he is un changeable. So his unchangeableness is his immutability. So God is unchanging in his perfections, his purposes, and his promises. Now, here's a good verse. You ought to look at that one. Deuteronomy 32, 4. This is what someone that knew him face to face says. It's interesting. How would you like someone to uh, describe you this way? Okay. Uh, but after we see it, we understand what Moses was trying to say. He said, he's the rock. How would you like someone to come up and say, you're a real rock? That is not to us positive. Why? Because we like to change. We like to look better and feel better. We don't like to stay the same. Nobody. People will do anything to not be stuck with, you know, with tedious, you know, everything staying the same. God, that's why they called him a rock. Because to the ancients, without having, you know, time-lapse photography. It looked like rocks just never changed. They just were rocks. You know, they're, they're hard and, and impervious to change. God is unchanging in his perfection. See, God is not becoming anything. That would just drive people crazy. Everybody wants to become more successful or understand or more in health or more fit or better looking. We're always changing. We're fixing th stuff that's wrong, and we're, we're, we're trying to get new strengths, and we're just always changing, and all the time our bodies are running down and we're wearing out. God is unchanging in his perfections. He doesn't get more loving. God could not love any one of us any more or any less. He's unchanging. God's not becoming anything. And see, we, all of a sudden, we can't understand that. We mean not becoming anything. We're all becoming older or stronger or richer or poorer or whatever. He also is unchanging in his purposes. God's purposes are fixed. In fact, uh, look at Malachi. Um, well, let's finish. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. In other words, he does it right the first time, doesn't need any changes. For all his ways are justice. Everything he does is absolutely just. A God of truth. I mean, Everything he says, everything he does, it's absolutely square. Without injustice, righteous and upright is he. I mean, could you say it more different ways, more <coughs> clearly, that God doesn't change? But look at Malachi. Uh, you might remember this one, uh, where the Lord says this in Malachi 3 and verse 6. I am the Lord. I do not change. He's unchangeable. That's what immutability is. Only unchangeableness uses more the biblical term. I do not change. It doesn't say I do not mutate, you know, immutate, immutable. He says, I change not. I am unchangeable. And, and it's something to think about. Now look, look, Hebrews goes into a quotation from the 102nd Psalm. And if you want, if you're marking these, 
um, the unchangeableness of God, one that you'd have to note in your Bible. And by the way, there are probably dozens of all these. I only picked a few. Uh, but Hebrews 1.10 <clears throat> says, O Lord, in the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth. You notice that's a, a quotation from Psalm 102, if you have a footnote in your Bible. Uh, and the heavens were the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. The whole universe is going to perish. It's going to suffer heat death, fire, actually. It's going to melt with a fervent heat. It's going to have a roaring sound. Peter describes it. The Lord showed it to him in 2 Peter 3. And the whole universe is going to dissolve. It's going to perish. But you, God, remain. They will all grow old like a garment. He says the, the whole universe, I mean, they're all worried about this comet. We thought it broke up. Maybe it didn't. I mean, but it's every whip around the sun, it's losing more of its mass. And, and everything is growing old like a garment, like a cloak. You'll fold them up and they will be changed. Verse 12, but you are the same. Your years will not fail. So God is unchangeable. And of course, the classic Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, here's a third attribute. So, so we talked about, you know, God's eternity. Time is vividly all the same. His unchangeableness, that, that God doesn't change and is not becoming anything. Now here's another one, his wisdom. His wisdom is that God always chooses the best results and the best means to those results. Now I'll read you, uh, let's see if that one is any longer. Um, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Specifies that God's decisions about what he is about to do will always be wise, that he will always bring about the best results from God's ultimate perspectives, and he will bring about those results through the best possible means. So that's a good summary of it. Let's look at Romans 11, and I'll just show you just a couple of, and again, these are all very popular verses, but if you were studying the wisdom of God, Paul, when he thought about it, just breaks out into this offering of praise. We call him a doxology. And he says in Romans 11, 33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge. And you notice he pairs together the doctrine of, of the attribute of wisdom with the doctrine or attribute of omniscience. That God's wisdom... He always chooses. See, the wisdom is how he applies. He chooses the best results and the best means to get those results, but it's predicated on, look what verse 33 says, and the knowledge, that's his, his omniscience. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. Now keep going to 1627, same book, and look what Paul says. To God alone, wise. See, God alone is wise. God is the only one that always chooses the best end result and the best way to get to that end result. It's very interesting uh, to think about. And then God's omniscience. And let's, let's look up uh, Hebrews 4. Just keep going to the right. You all know this from the Word of God is quick and powerful. Uh, but the omniscience of God is God is knowing himself and all things actual and possible. That shows up all the way through the Bible. If it, it, think of the implications on this in just a moment, but think about what we're saying. God's omniscience, his knowledge, is God knows himself, which is quite a statement. Because God is infinite. So God knows his infinite self, which is amazing that, that it's not like us, who we have to try and remember something, we think, oh, there it is. Everything is vividly present to God all the time. Everything that is happening, everything that happened, everything that will happen, and then overlay that with this. That's the actual. He also knows what's possible. You know how computers can play chess and they can figure out 47 moves down of every 
you know, every move you do, it can tell, you know, postulated out the nth degree of what the possibilities are of the game. Did you know that's cute? That's a computer. God knows all things actual and possible for everything for the quasars, for the nebula out here, for this comet going around. He knows if he slowed it one kilometer an hour, how much longer it would last. He knows if he speeded it up a kilometer a second, how short its life would be. And he knows how long he's going to let it last because everything consists by his hand. This one's very interesting to read, um, uh, but we don't have time. Let's, let's look at John 4.13. That's why I gave you the shorts instead of, that's why theology books are 1,500 pages long. 413, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Did you know that the Lord, when he was upbraiding Chorazim and Bethsaida and Capernaum in the Gospels, he looked at them and he said, do you know what? If I would have lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, like I lived and set my headquarters up in Capernaum, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented of their homosexuality. He said, if I would have lived in Tyre and Sidon instead of in Capernaum, they would have all repented. Did he live in Sodom and Gomorrah 2100 years BC? No. Did he live in Tyre and Sidon? No. But he knew. Because God's omniscience is, God only knows himself and all of his infinity, but he knows all things actual, past, present, and future, and everything that's possible within everything. That, you know, they're talking about, you know, giga, and then, uh, let's see, gigabytes, and then whatever, petabytes, I don't even know all the things, you know, the, the higher uh, computer um, storage numbers, zettabytes, and all these things. Can you imagine the storage facility of God's omniscience? For every atom, for every grain of sand, he knows if the grain of sand, you know, had gone to the Red Sea instead of the Indian Ocean, what would have happened to it? He knows everything actual and possible. Now look at 1 John 3.20. Keep going from Hebrews. And here's another statement about the Lord. Uh, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. The Lord knows that if we would have gone here and done that, that would have happened. He knows if we would have gone there and done that, that would have happened. And he knows what we did. And he knows why he allowed that to happen. And we don't. Okay, so one more doctrine. Here's the doctrine of prayer. And we don't have time... Uh, to go through all of this, but it's fascinating to think of not just me praying, you know, the Lord's Prayer or before my meals. By the way, there is a new generation of people who don't pray before their meals. Did you know that? If you don't have enough time or if you're in a public place or if it's a business lunch or if you have, you know, don't have whatever, you just don't pray anymore. Did you know Jesus prayed before his meals in public? Did you know he said that everything, every bit of food is to be received with thanksgiving? Did you know praying over your food is not because Norman Rockwell painted it, you know? And in the idyllic American family, it's because God commanded that in everything we're supposed to receive our food with thanks. And Jesus modeled it, and the Apostle Paul commended it. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. The doctrine of prayer is it's our personal communication with God, which teaches us many things. That God loves persistence, he loves humility, he loves us kind of being in step with his will, he loves us to be empowered as we pray in the power of the Spirit. So there's a lot of dynamics of prayer. But among other things, prayer changes the way God acts. Really? I mean, I thought whatever will be, will be. Because God has already, he knows all the possibilities, Ah, but that's why he didn't burn up the Israelites. And that's why he let Hezekiah live 15 more years. Because something is amazing about the doctrine of prayer. Here's an example. You want to read about it? James 4.2 says, <coughs> You have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it on your lusts. You know what that's saying? 
Prayer changes the way God acts. If you don't ask, he won't give it. If you do ask, and you're asking wrongly, he won't give it either. See, there, there is something about the doctrine of prayer that, that we really need to think about. Luke, the same thing. How much more shall your Father in heaven give to those that ask him? And then this classic one, the golden calf with Moses saying, Lord, and he interceded. He said, you can, you can, you can send me to hell. That's what he said. Just don't destroy them. Paul said the same thing. Do you remember? In chapter 9 of Romans, he says, I, you can accurse, you can make me anathema if you'll just save some of my Jewish brothers. Paul's intercession, Moses' intercession, Christ saying that we should, we should knock on the door. Remember what Matthew 7 says? Ask, seek, and knock. And the Lord commended the, the widow that kept coming to the judge and saying, Come on, give me justice. And he said, shall not your father in heaven much more respond to you than that unjust judge? So the doctrine of prayer is that we get to communicate personally with God and <coughs> prayer changes the way God acts. In fact, here's something from uh, Wayne Grudem. Is, uh, he used to be at, I think, Trinity, and now he's at Phoenix Seminary uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He's just kind of like a, a supercomputer on steroids for the Bible. He's just a very brilliant man. But we're studying, as elders and deacons, his systematic theology, which I think has 56 or so chapters, and, uh, you know, uh, 1,200 or 1,000 pages or something. But on page 377, this is what he says. This is fascinating. If we were really convinced that prayer changes the way God acts, and he says this right after he theologically demonstrates that, uh, that that is congruent with systematic orthodox theology, that prayer does change the way God acts. But he says, if we were really convinced of the truth the Bible presents, that prayer changes the way God acts, and that God does bring about remarkable changes in the world in response to prayer, God has chosen the means of prayer to accomplish his will, and only those who will avail themselves of the means of prayer will see that happen. And that's just the bottom line, the reason why Paul said pray without ceasing, and Jesus got up early, you know, or stayed up all night, and, and got up early in the morning, and just prayed morning, noon, and night, and he didn't even, he didn't even have our problems. And he prayed far more than any of us do. And, and he says, you guys should follow my example. Remarkable changes in the world in response to prayer, as Scripture repeatedly teaches that he does. So if we really believed all that, then we would pray much more than we do. If we pray little, it is probably because we do not really believe that prayer accomplishes much at all. And that's really... Our, our misunderstanding maybe of the case of Ra theology, just thinking it's all going to happen anyway, so why should I bother? Life is too hard, and I, I have too much to do to pray. You know, kind of like Martin Luther said, you know, I have so much to do today, I've got to spend the first three hours praying. <laughs> that would be the last thing 21st century people would think, right? I've got so much to do, I've got to get started doing it, right? Jesus had to go and cover all the cities of Israel, so he spent all night praying. I mean, if we had to have a big exam or something, would we spend all night praying? No, we've got to rest up. We've got to strengthen ourselves. See, there's something we don't understand about how God acts and how God changes the world and how he responds to our prayer, or else we would be drawn to prayer like a magnet. Because most of us, once we see the value, it, it hits us. So let's culminate that. We started out, does God change his mind? And does he do so in Job 33, 14? Well, the answer is, yeah and no. 